Hello, uh, this is Rafael Esteban. It is my pleasure to moderate this session, to co-chair this session with Professor Massimo Lebrero from the University of Lyon. And this session will be devoted to the optimal management of hepatitis B. The first two speakers are outstanding speakers. First of all, uh, will be Thomas Berg, professor of medicine at uh, Leipzig University. He will talk on the guidelines for hepatitis B. And the second uh, speaker will be Professor Singji Lim from Singapore, from the University of Singapore. He will talk about the long-term effects of NUCs on the treatment of hepatitis B. So thank you, the organizers, for uh, uh, giving us the opportunity to chair this session. And I am asking Professor Thomas Berg to initiate his presentation. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, dear colleagues, it's a pleasure to be here with you and I thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk on the international treatment guidelines. And the major guidelines as listed here coming from the Americans, the Asian Pacific and ESL are all published between 2016 and 2017 with a recent update in 2018 for the ASLD. So all these guidelines are getting on in years, you may say. But there is a, still a global consensus in terms of the goals of therapy. So all the guidelines agree that the main goal of therapy is to improve survival and quality of life by preventing disease progression and then consequently also HCC development. But how to achieve these goals? What are the endpoints? And again, here there's agreement among the guidelines that the induction of long-term suppression of HPV DNA level represents a main endpoint for all current, all current treatment strategies because it's associated with improvement in liver histology and the other biomarkers. HBS loss still in these guidelines defined as an optimal endpoint, but infrequently achievable. But you know, with the advent of new treatment option, there's more and more interest and in also to provide guidance, not only for designing studies, but also for endpoints for clinical trials. And it has become clear that achieving this functional cure with ASL loss is not so easy. So we are really want to uh, provide guidance for something that can be called an attainable partial functional cure, where the patient could be still positive, but nevertheless, has no risk of disease progression. And this again is defined by low or not undetectable HPV DNA levels, but it's a bit unclear what is the cutoff of low level HPV DNA. So what about the current recommendation in terms of treatment initiation? And I also want like to start with a global consensus. And the consensus is that you need a pattern of HPV DNA and ALT to guide treatment indication and initiation, but also taking into account the E status and the cirrhosis status. And there is consensus that if ALT is greater than two times upper limit of normal and you have HPV DNA greater than 2000 in E negative, greater than 20,000 in E positive, you can start treatment. And if there's cirrhosis, any HPV DNA, irrespective of ALT, is an indication for treatment. But there are uncertainties and inconsistencies, if you like, or no global consensus in terms of the definition what normal ALT means, as well as the ALT, but also the HPV DNA cutoffs that guide treatment indication in E positive and E negative patients. And a big concern and uncertainty is really how to deal with the formerly called immune tolerant HPV infection, normal ALT, very high HPV DNA. So this shows you an example coming from the recent update of the ASLD guideline, where you can see 
even if you have high HPV DNA, if ALT is normal, you should not treat. But here, the definition of normal ALT, the cutoffs are lower than for the other guidelines, 35 for males and 25 for females. Here, an example of the APASL recommendation for the E-positive ones. And again, even if you have slightly elevated ALT or it's normal, high HPV DNA, you should only treat if you have moderate to severe inflammation or significant fibrosis. And you can see in all these situations, liver histology in terms of inflammation and fibrosis is really a major indicator for treatment in indication and initiation. With the ASL easel guideline, well, we try to, to ease a bit the situation in terms of that we do not separate E positive from E negative, but if HPV DNA is greater than 2000 ALT elevated, you can start treatment. But again, you need at least some or moderate inflammation and fibrosis. But for the immune tolerance, the E positive chronic HPV infection, we define a treatment indication by patients being older than 30 years, regardless of severity of liver histological lesions. So the question is, are current recommendation for treatment initiation appropriate in terms of achieving the predefined treatment goals? And the point I want to make is that treatment strategies to prevent HCC development may differ in some ways from those that are needed to prevent fibrosis progression. And it looks like that the current guidelines are mainly dealing with HPV as a chronic HPV infection as a progressive fibrotic disease. And here, perhaps you have more time because we know if you even start treatment relatively late in an F3 stage, you can completely prevent further progression and quite often you can reduce fibrosis or improve fibrosis in these patients. But if HPV is seen more as an oncogenic disease, if there is a carcinogenic state, then you cannot turn any more the, um, back the clock. So it might be a missed in opportunity for early intervention. So I would like to share with you in a couple of minutes, some new findings that could be considered for refined treatment indication and initiation in, for, in next guidelines. And I can tell you that ASLD, but also ESL have already commissioned new guidelines for hepatitis B. And the first study I would like to show you is one dealing with HPV DNA integration into host genome. And this is an interesting study because they randomized patients with high HPV DNA, low ALT levels, so-called immune tolerant, into treatment or placebo, and looked over time of three years. And they could show that with a treatment, you can reduce transcriptionally active HPV integration which may have implication also on post-gene dysregulation. Another interesting study also coming from Asia looked at how the baseline HPV DNA will have an effect on further on-treatment HCC development in patients being treated with long-term NUC treatment. And on the first glance, a bit counterintuitive association was seen that those started with very high HPV DNA, greater than eight log, at the lowest risk of HCC in the long term, as compared to those with the lowest HPV DNA, five to six log, having the highest. Meaning, if you have an early intervention, even in the immune tolerant, E negative chronic, E positive chronic infection phase, you can significantly reduce the HCC risk on treatment. And the last study here dealing with those with HBS antigen zero clearance. And it's one of the largest studies with 831 patients with S loss being followed for more than 10 years. And overall, the risk is 1% per year HCC development. And you can see the highest risk if you have the S loss achieved at high age, older age, and cirrhosis. The last point, very briefly, because it will be discussed in a minute in a debate, are the stopping rules. And all guidelines agree that if you're E positive and you achieve E0 conversion, you can stop treatment if you have no cirrhosis. 
but inconsistency in terms of the E-negative stage, where ASLD recommend indefinite treatment until S loss, where the others are more liberal and may allow stopping or for a parcel, nearly all patients will stop. And my question is whether we are applying double standards in terms of how we deal with E-positive and E-negative patients. So in E-positive patients, not only S loss, but also silencing of the transcriptional activity of HPV DNA reflected by E0 conversion and the induction of a true inactive carrier is an appropriate endpoint according to these guidelines. So why should this not also be the case for HBS antigen negative disease? And there's an interesting study that could be perhaps used also for further finite NUC treatment showing that the lower the pretreatment HPV DNA level, the higher the likelihood that if you stop once NUC treatment, you can achieve HBS loss. So being more than 20% if you start with an HPV DNA lower than 20,000. And you are reminded that having low level viremia, not in all guidelines, is already a clear indication, indicator for treatment, meaning that you start with a milder disease perhaps a finite treatment duration, and you are able to achieve S loss. But I would like to summarize that the 1618 international guidelines focus mainly on inhibiting fibrosis progression for treatment indication and endpoints. But the prevention of HPV DNA and HEC development should be in the future giving greater focus in guideline updates that require therapeutic approaches other than those established for the prevention of fibrosis progression. And beyond HBS loss, other reliable endpoint biomarkers and their appropriate cutoff values should be defined to guide off treatment management. I thank you very much for your attention. My name is Seng Ji Lim, and I'd like to thank Professor Marcelin and Professor Marc Boulier for inviting me to give this talk uh, virtually at the Paris Hepatology Conference this year. My talk is entitled Long-Term Effects of Nukes. These are my disclosures. And we all know the mechanism of nucleoside and nucleotide inhibitors. They act on uh, HPV polymerase and they act on each RNA-dependent minus strand replication, as well as positive strand replication, and also reduce recycling of HPV into the nucleus. There are two broad classes of oral antiviral agents, nucleoside analogs listed here, and nucleotide analogs listed on the right, which have different structures and slightly different mechanisms of action, but their efficacy is quite similar. Uh, in my talk today, I'll be talking on two broad subjects, efficacy and safety. The efficacy will be divided into clinical outcomes, such as death, liver failure, cirrhosis, HCC, and surrogate outcomes, such as serological outcomes, biomarkers, fibrosis, viral integration. And safety outcomes, we should be looking at specific safety signals and uncommon safety signals. So just as a starting point, I think it's good to understand the evolution of these biomarkers uh, over the course of an oral nucleoside analog therapy. You can see here that at baseline, 100% of patients had HPV DNA, but only 83% had uh, H uh, HPV uh, pregenomic RNA, and only 71 had correlated antigen. Within a year, HPV DNA became negative, but it has taken much longer for the other biomarkers, HPV RNA and correlated antigen to reduce. In fact, at five years, you still have significant but uh, small amounts of pregenomic RNA and HPV correlated antigen. When we look at the efficacy and clinical endpoints, this is a, a meta-analysis by uh, Professor Anna Locke going back a few years ago where uh, we only had data on lamivudin, and observational studies show that uh, lamivudin reduced death uh, and uh, reduced HCC as well as reduced decompensated liver disease. Uh, of course, it's now 
uh, not efficacious, to, not uh, um, ethical to perform um, randomized controlled trials of oral antiviral agents versus no therapy. So we will not have high quality data on this particular outcome. The largest uh, uh, randomized controlled trial for oral antiviral therapy was published uh, uh, a few years ago where 12,500 patients uh, in a global study were randomized to entecapir or non-entecapir uh, drugs uh, listed down here. The mean follow-up was 78 to 86 months or approximately 10 years. Uh, most of the patients had no cirrhosis, uh, but about 16 had compensated cirrhosis and 3.5% had decompensated cirrhosis. Uh, the majority of the patients were eagent positive. And when we look at the uh, data here on liver disease progression, we can see here that non-responders had a high risk of the liver disease progression, as well as hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, suggesting that uh, viral suppression is really quite crucial in uh, uh, reducing uh, clinical endpoints. When we look at surrogate markers, can, this is a study I want to highlight. Uh, this is a group of e antigen positive patients with high viral load and normal ALT. Uh, in other words, uh, immune tolerant patients. These were randomized to uh, TDF uh, tenofovir or tenofovir plus FTC, also called Truvada. And after four years of therapy, the group that had combination of TDF and FTC had better viral suppression, but I would like to highlight that the patients uh, in that group still were unable to achieve complete viral suppression in about 20% of the cases. There was no uh, difference in serological markers of E antigen seroconversion, which were relatively low. So even dual combination therapy, may not be able to suppress HPV DNA completely. And when we look at the uh, uh, development of e engine uh, clearance, uh, we can see that in this very long-term study, going up to uh, 14 years, the rate of e engine clearance seems to plateau off after about the fourth to the sixth year. Uh, and consequently, a lot of patients still remain e antigen positive despite being on nucleoside analogs. Uh, we can see that patients will have gradual reduction of S antigen uh, over time. But uh, in this uh, long term study from Japan, we can see that the reduction of S antigen was even was over a 10 year period of time less than uh, one log and that this may actually be related to uh, genotypes, with genotype A having a better outcome than uh, the other genotypes. The cumulative s antigen loss over this period of time was less than 5% of the entire cohort over 14 years. When we look at different uh, nucleotide analogs for efficacy, this mixed model comparison of different nucleoside analogs uh, were, were evaluated against each other, and tenofovir was ranked number one, uh, both for reduction in DNA, ALT normalization, and uh, e antigen seroconversion. Interestingly, when we look at the high uh, uh, barrier uh, nucleoside analogs such as tenofovir and entecavir, over a period of 144 weeks, we can see that tenofovir was somewhat better than entecavir at DNA suppression, uh, with 91% versus 86% achieving complete viral suppression uh, at the end of 144 weeks. Now, F residual viremia is a problem even with uh, patients on entecavir. And in this study, patients were switched from entecavir to TAF. And you can see that uh, uh, in the top two graphs here, there was uh, increasing uh, viral suppression and ALT normalization after switching to TAF. In this 425 patient real world cohort with multiple comorbidities, uh, when we look at the renal function, we can see that there's some uncertainty about its outcome. 
Uh, in those with uh, normal renal function, 11% worsened to CKD2, while those who already had CKD2, 7% worsened to CKD3, but on the other hand, about 18% improved back to CKD1. Uh, it seems that these might be related to the natural history of the CKD rather than the drugs themselves. When we look at fibrosis and liver uh, stiffness, you can see that these studies going back a few years ago showed definitely regression of cirrhosis on, based on liver biopsies uh, in two cohorts of patients, one treated with tenofovir and one treated with entecavir. We're also seeing similar results for non-invasive markers with a reduction in FIT4 values, as well as a reduction in uh, um, liver stiffness, particularly in those with advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis. When we look at viral integration, it's uh, particularly interesting that uh, nucleoside analogs actually reduce viral integration and nucleoside clonal expansion. So this could be a promising uh, uh, strategy to reduce the risk of heptocellular carcinoma. Fine. Uh, I'd now want to discuss this controversial topic about tenofovir versus entecavir for reduction of HCC. This original study uh, from Korea in this nationwide study showed that uh, tenofovir had a significant reduction in uh, HCC development, uh, both in uh, uh, the nationwide cohort, propensity match cohort, and a, a hospital validation cohort. And this has been supported by further studies in this individual patient meta-analysis, also demonstrating a similar outcome with that subgroup analysis favoring tenofovir over entecavir. A large study uh, in the Chinese cohort also demonstrated positive uh, 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 benefits of uh, um, uh, tenofovir by propensity weighting or propensity matching. However, not all studies did show an improvement with tenofovir. And in this propensity match study, we can see that there was actually no difference in patients treated with tenofovir and tecovir in terms of development of HCC. And in a further study of propensity matching, there was also uh, no evidence that tenofovir and entecavir uh, were different in, in any way in terms of HCC reduction. So what is the answer? Does tenofovir reduce HCC compared to entecavir? We don't have a final conclusion, but the evidence certainly supports tenofovir uh, better than entecavir. There is some evidence that tenofovir and TAF have better viral suppression, which may be a contributing factor. On balance, there's no harm to use tenofovir if there's potential benefit to reduce HCC. I want to come now to viral resistance, and we know that this is really quite historical. There's not many cases of viral resistance we're seeing these days. And in fact, the uh, eight-year uh, study of tenofovir showed an absence of uh, uh, tenofovir-related resistant mutations. But then even though that was absent, it doesn't mean they don't exist. So in this study where they uh, looked at cell lines and created um, uh, tenofovir-resistant mutations, we can see that the p 17 g and the multi-drug resistance had uh, decreased uh, uh, susceptibility to tenofovir, tenofovir in cell lines. Whether that happens in real life, I think we still need to examine. Uh, uh, what is good news is that uh, those patients who had multi-drug resistance or MDR, uh, regardless of whether they have high or low titer of virus, that over a period of 240 weeks, uh, both of these groups can uh, then have uh, control with tenofovir versus, or even combination therapy. When we look at the efficacy in cirrhosis, we can see that uh, in this historical cohort study, uh, historical control study, apologies, there was a significant reduction in all the important outcomes, KCC, variable, variable bleeding, SBP, hepatic encephalopathy, liver-related mortality, and all-cause mortality. Uh, of course, um, when we compare entecavir versus tenofovir for cirrhosis, uh, we are unable to check a difference in that outcome. But once again, we're seeing that tenofovir appears to be superior to entecavir in terms of 
undetectable HPV DNA. But one benefit of uh, uh, um, antiviral therapy has been in the regression of liver cirrhosis with nucleoside analogs and a very low rate of development of new uh, uh, varices. In decompensated cirrhosis, we can see that uh, lamivudine and, 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 and adifovir were compared versus entecavir. And you can see here that entecavir was superior to lamivudine and adifovir in terms of improvement of CPT scores and uh, uh, renal impairment. And in, finally, in ACLF, there, we can see that the short-term survival in ACLF was no different between entecavir and lamivudine, but the long-term mortality was superior in the entecavir group for ACLF. Finally, I just want to touch quickly on safety. I think most of you are well aware of the safety issues regarding to the uh, um, uh, approved drugs. And I've just summarized them here. Tabibidin uh, leads to muscle toxicity, and in some cases, uh, lamivudine as well. Uh, of course, tabibidin is also known for uh, problems with peripheral neuropathy. Tenofovir and adifovir have uh, nephrotoxicity problems. And lactic acidosis may occur in tabibidin and entecavir treated patients. Uh, just by uh, way of summary here, for adifovir, five-year uh, renal impairment is 3 to 4 percent, while tenofovir is only 1 percent. And uh, this is a rather busy slide. Uh, but uh, we can summarize it that the progression of uh, renal impairment in uh, tenofovir treated patients is relatively small and seldom clinically significant and occasionally will have Fanconi syndrome. Uh, LDT or tabibidin improves renal function and TAF does not affect uh, renal impairment at all. So to conclude, nucleoside analogs are the backbone of chronic hepatitis B therapy. They have proven to be generally safe and efficacious in viral suppression. Current high genetic barrier nucleosides have very low levels of resistance. As moderate evidence for improved clinical outcomes, and most of the benefits are surrogate outcomes. They seldom lead to adverse antigen loss and have been used as long-term therapy, although stopping nucleosides is now being explored as a therapeutic option. And nucleoside analog therapy may be the backbone of future antiviral therapies aimed at achieving functional cure. I'd like to thank you for your attention and like to uh, 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 remind you that Science Hepatitis B Cure will be in Singapore June to 3rd this year, and the Singapore Hepatology Conference will be concurrent in there. Uh, hope you all be able to attend either in person or online. Thank you very much for your attention. So uh, we are back to the to the live session, and we have a few minutes to discuss. I don't see any question in the in the in the chat for now. So I just uh, ask uh, Rafael if he has any question to the speakers that are with us. Otherwise, I may uh, I may do something myself. Just uh, a brief comment. There are some studies showing that even those HBSOG negative who have clear HBSOG, the CCC DNA can reactive the infection. So again, the functional cure may not be a functional cure. Uh, what is your opinion, Sim and Thomas? Yeah, well, should I start? Yeah, I tried a bit in my talk to challenge a bit, as you have seen, this concept of functional cure. And of course, what I would see as a functional cure is that we are, can really um, convince the patient that he will not suffer anymore from decompensation, liver-related events, and HCC. But of course, reactivation is an issue, but we know that we can prevent it. And I think this doesn't speak against a concept of a kind of functional meaning you can prevent disease, unwanted disease outcomes. But I think it's really an issue that has to be solved by current guidelines and updated guidelines, whether we now, with the help perhaps of new biomarkers, can come up to other endpoints that will help us to guide the patient in the long term and in the future. And because I think it's not really realistic so far that for the majority of patients, we can really achieve as loss. 
if I may just add a very short comment on that, the, the, if patients lose S, uh, the probability to, a, to have a spontaneous reactivation is really, uh, really marginal. Uh, so usually the patients that lose S and reactivate uh, have been subjected to any intervention, very often medical intervention, very often just some steroids that reactivate the, the residual CCCDNA uh, in the liver. So uh, I think that the, the, the concept, the biological concept that uh, Raphael put uh, out uh, is uh, true, but uh, the clinical consequence is not against the concept of functional cure. We may like or not the term functional cure. We may want to adopt other terms, but I think that still uh, has some, some uh, logic uh, into it. Obviously, the exception may always exist in clinics and biology, but uh, what we know is that usually after S loss, the residual CCCDNA is really uh, much less prone to reactivate than in patients that have been subjected to, to nuke suppression or whatever else, or spontaneous. Good comment, Massimo. Any other, any other question? I think with the time is going, uh, just one question to, to Thomas again. Uh, what do you advocate to, to uh, you, you were provocative, the e, why to submit the E-positive patients and the E-negative patients to different rules? Uh, what do you advocate there? Uh, what, do you, what is behind uh, that, uh, that uh, sentence? Uh, because we know that finally uh, the, the E-positive uh, e patient, the seroconvert, go into a very long phase of inactivity, clinically speaking. So you know, I, I, I do not want to, because we will have the discussion right now with the stopping concept. My point is only that after E0 conversion, you can see a carrier, if you like, or reactivation. And my point is that you can also get a, a stage of silencing CCCDNA in the E positive, in the E negative disease. We do not have the marker yet, but I think there are new markers okay. out, and this is we have to work on. Would you agree, okay. Sinji? Uh, okay, I think uh, um, it's uh, still a controversial area. I think uh, um, we'll have to wait and see uh, what the data shows us. <laughs> so I, I think that we have to move on. I know that uh, it is always bad to stop uh, discussions, even if our discussion among us ourselves. And now I, it's my pleasure to introduce the next, uh, the next session. Uh, that is um, related to uh, the controversy whether to stop MOOCs or not. We will have uh, Maria Buti from Barcelona speaking pro and uh, Pietro Lampertico from Milan uh, speaking against the cons. And uh, let's just uh, launch the session and we will have a lively discussion, I'm sure, at the end of it. Please, the public, uh, put questions in the in the in the in the in the chat because uh, uh, we will uh, will monitor it uh, closely to allow everybody to intervene in the in the discussion. Hi everybody! First, I would like to thank uh, Professor Patrick Marcelin to invite me to the Paris meeting again this time virtual, but I hope that next time can be physical. My task today is the debate with uh, Pietro Lampertico on the controversy on stopping nukes. And I have to support stopping nukes. These are my disclosures. All the international guidelines are recommend for HBE antigen positive patients stopping nukes after HBS antigen clearance. There is complete agreement and also in those E antigen positive after uh, E antigen loss and seroconversion and a period of consolidation between six and 12 months. The debate, the controversy is in E antigen negative patients. In this subset of patients, Isel, for the first time, opened the door to stop a therapy in a subset of patients, in selected patients with biological suppression for more than three years, 
uh, before HBS antigen clearance. And this is completely different for double ASLD guidelines that the current recommendation is continuous with NUC, long treatment with NUCs. A puzzle also in a similar way that ESL guidelines are recommend stopping treatment in E-negative patients after E and HBS antigen loss if they have at least uh, two years of undetectable viremia. And there is agreement in uh, not stopping treatment in patients with cirrhosis. So for these e antigen negative patients, the recommendation of a stopping treatment is only for those without liver cirrhosis. What is the goal of a stopping treatment? The goal, and for me, the main goal of stopping before HBS antigen loss in e negative patients is to achieve HBS antigen loss. And this endpoint is achieved in 20% of patients after two or three years of follow-up after stopping treatment. What are the advantage of stopping treatment? So the first advantage is the possibility of HBS antigen loss, and there is um, Mm, enough data showing that HBS antigen loss increased survival. A second advantage is avoid the potential uh, safety issues of NUCs, particularly renal and bone dysfunction. Another advantage is reduced cost. And we can achieve this situation, the long-term therapy of in approximately 50% of patients because some of them uh, don't achieve HBS antigen loss but can achieve uh, an in inactive carrier state. For this, it's very important the careful selection of the patient and the predictor of HBS antigen loss. The most important predictor are HBS antigen levels at the time of stopping therapy. And there is a cutoff is that is different for Asian studies and European studies, less than 100 for Asian patients achieve between 21-59% of HBS antigen loss, and in Europeans, the cutoff is uh, it's higher, it's 1,000. In addition to HBS uh, antigen levels, HBB RNA levels and correlated antigen levels also help to identify patients that are going to achieve HBS antigen loss or at least a sustained virological response after stopping NUX. So in summary, in e antigen negative uh, patients, NUX therapy can be stopped in selected candidates, no cirrhosis, HBB DNA persistent and detectable, and low levels of HBS antigen at the time of stopping NUCs. And you and the patient should be ready for a careful selection of patients. Clearly, we need to discuss individually with uh, each patient if they want to stop treatment. They need a more intensive monitoring and excellent patient adherence and expert physicians in retreatment because 50% of patients will need a uh, retreatment during the follow-up. Thank you very much for your attention. So good morning to everyone. Thank you for this invitation. I'd like to thank the organizer for giving me this challenging topic. I will try to convince you in the next five minutes that, that you should not discontinue oral therapy for hepatitis B before the antigen loss in uh, patients with chronic E antigen negative chronic hepatitis. These are my disclosures. This is a summary of the strategy that we already presented a few, a few years ago. Um, so on the left side, you see the situation during long-term oral therapy. Um, long-term oral therapy means normal LT levels, undetectable DNA, no problems, no issues, very simple management. 
Unfortunately, this is not associated with high S antigen loss rate, but this is a very quiet and easy to manage situation. Then you decide to stop therapy before S antigen loss, and then you enter in the second phase, characterized by a virological rebound almost in everyone, a biochemical rebound of flare in most of the patients, uh, and sometimes even a severe flare. And then after some time, so called consolidation phase, you will enter in the long-term outcomes characterized by different outcomes, including 50 to 60% of the patients that will restart antiviral therapy. And as you see, this is kind of complicated uh, strategy. And the reason why you should not use this strategy in most of your patients are the following. First of all, the management of therapy, one year of therapy highlighted here, here on the right hand side is very complicated if you compare to the on treatment manager in the center of the slide. Specifically, you need a, a very good compliance for patients, from doctors, a lot of experience in your centers. The overall cost will increase, the commitment time will increase, and you will have to do a lot of monitoring. But there is another reason why you should be very careful with this. If the endpoint is functional cure, it's antigen loss, well, if you stop therapy, you will achieve this in 13% of the patients only after four years in this large study. And even if you select for predictors as antigen below 1,000 in white or below 100 in Asians, still the proportion of S-antigen loss will be 40 to 30%. So most will not achieve S-antigen loss. In another study, again, there is an 8% again probability to achieve S-antigen loss. Most were not white or Caucasian patients. And again, the predictor, the good predictor wore a antigen below 10, but below 10 was observed only 5% of the patients. And even if you achieve this, only 4, 45% of the patients over one year achieve a antigen loss. Actually, most did not achieve, even with new biomarker, such as correlated antigen in this study or HPV RNA in other studies. Really, this was not very easy to identify these patients. Well, but there is another point which I think is very relevant, and this is safety. You know, this is a nice case of uh, recently published of a patient that was enrolled in a randomized control study. He stopped oral therapy before his antigen loss, and he had a very severe flare of ALT characterized by liver failure. And he was rescued by an early transplantation and he's alive today just because he was managed by a very good center in UK, London, and they were able to do a liver transplantation very fast. But this is not the case in many centers. And there are other cases of severe flare and liver failure following new discontinuation before the antigen loss. So you have to be very careful. Sometimes it's very complicated to anticipate the outcome of an ALT flare. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, moderator and chairman. So these are the take home messages. New discontinuation before the antigen loss in E antigen negative chronic pathology is possible, but in selected patients only. But management is very complicated, demanding, expensive. The probability to a clear S antigen is very limited, and predictors of S antigen loss are not well defined. And safety could be a major problem, even in very experienced centers. Don't forget, current new therapy is very effective, cheap, safe, is to be managed, and associated with improved survival. In many new therapies, therapeutics, being able to achieve a antigen loss are now under development. Thank you very much for your attention. So, Rafael, it's up to you now. Okay, Massimo. So, I have a <laughs> question. I have a question for both speakers. What about the risk of liver carcinoma? in those patients who stop NOOCs. Is there any relationship, is there any probability of uh, increased chance of uh, developing liver carcinoma in those patients? Uh, thank you for the question. 
I think uh, there is no specific higher risk in patients who stop uh, NUCs if they achieve HBS antigen clearance. The risk of developing HCC, it will be the same in those inactive carriers. And I think in those that will have a potential high risk of developing HCC, that are those patients who persist or who have a, a virological re rebound, as Pietro has shown, and as I mentioned, the indication of restart treatment is clear. So for me, stopping NUCs, uh, having a good uh, monitoring is not associated with a higher risk of HCC. But let's see, Pietro. So, opinion. well, I think that's a very important point. Uh, to give a very short answer, the answer for me is we do not know yet. Uh, we don't have a long-term follow-up of these patients. Many have to restart antiviral therapy, and they were, the, these patients were generally very well selected. And also, ACC is a rare event. So we need large court, longer duration of follow-up to identify whether cancer could be a problem in these patients. So, uh, Pietro, in your clinical practice, you don't stop NUCs in any patient, in any E negative patient, or you discuss with them and you take uh, uh, a decision? We normally do not stop nuke therapy unless there are very, very specific conditions. For example, you know, someone really willing to stop for some personal reasons or Patients with a very specific profile, you know, very low S antigen levels, HBV, RNA negativity, correlated antigen negativity, maybe in these few selected patients, we uh, try to stop therapy. What about you, Maria? I agree with Pietro. Uh, I, I stopped treatment in a very, very few patients. Only those. Uh, patients or uh, people that want to uh, who want to stop treatment and and I am focused a lot in HBS antigen levels. Uh, I am not going to support stopping treatment in patients with uh, HBS antigen levels higher than 1000. Massimo and if I may uh, Rafael there is a one question in the chat I will read it for you. And uh, the question is now, what is the role of a correlated antigen or CREG for stopping nuke? It was already mentioned by both of you. Uh, Maria, can you, can you tell us something? And uh, eventually Pietro can comment on that. Yeah, uh, it, uh, HB core antigen uh, levels are useful in those patients who have less than three locks. The problem is that the majority of in-negative patients, even at the beginning of treatment, have low levels of correlated antigen. So the utility alone, I think it's, it's relatively low. If you combine with other markers with uh, uh, HBB RNA and HBS antigen levels, I think then could be more useful. If I can make a comment, uh, so if the end point, yeah, if the end point is this antigen loss, the measurement of correlated antigen is not very useful. If the end point is avoid severe flares of therapy, then the measurement of correlated antigen could be useful before stopping therapy. I fully agree with you. I just want to add a, a little comment on that. The most important point that has been made by both of you is that probably you really need uh, to combine multiple markers. And even if correlated antigen and HBV and circulating HBV RNA do both reflect somehow the, the transcriptional activity of CCC DNA, for some reason that we are still trying to fully understand, they are not completely overlapping. There is a question of sensitivity, but not only. And so the real problem is that we do not have yet, and uh, Maria and Pietro can comment on that, we do not have yet any algorithm that allows us to, to combine S uh, levels and the correlated antigen levels and uh, uh, RNA today to have a clear-cut guidance to, to stop and to which 
in which context. So I don't know whether you want to comment on that, but I think that is important to remember that the two buyer markets have similar but not equal uh, um, uh, meaning, meaning clinical. So final comment from Maria and Pietro. Uh, I think the, the the suggestion of Massimo is is really important. It's it's try to do a, a systematic analysis so and combine all of these studies of stopping uh, nukes, if the and studies having these uh, markers and try to to do an algorithm. I think this could be useful. Well, I agree one with question. Maria. I agree with Maria. I think we should uh, have a larger collaborative effort, prospective studies, combining all these markers together with the antigen levels to try to identify the best predictors of those patients with a higher likelihood of doing very well of therapy. And the European study, the IPCURE, uh, uh, will be uh, very useful in, in this sense. Okay, yes, thank you. Audience. I think we then, have to move on to the next presentation. So uh, I would like to introduce Fabien Julim from the University of Lyon. He will talk on new drugs for HPV cure. Fabien, this is your turn. Hello, um, I would like first to, to thank Professor Massena and Professor Bollier for the invitation to give this talk on new drugs to cure hepatitis B virus infections. Here are my disclosures. As you all know, the main challenges to cure hepatitis B virus infection uh, mainly rely on the uh, defective immune responses and the persistence of our CCC DNA in chronically infected uh, hepatocytes. Um, the um, international community has defined uh, endpoints for emerging therapies uh, that mainly rely um, on uh, viral biomarkers uh, with the assessment of uh, these markers in the blood circulation that reflect the viral replication and viral persistence in the liver compartment. And these uh, endpoints are mainly defined by sustained of therapy responses uh, with an optimal goal, which is the functional cure defined by undetectable HBS antigen and HBV DNA levels uh, in, uh, in serum, as well as normal transaminase levels, which are usually accompanied by the persistence of low CCC DNA levels and of integrated viral sequences uh, in the liver. There is also a, an important intermediate uh, goal or endpoint to be uh, considered, which is defined by a partial, partial cure, um, defined by low HPS antigen levels and undetectable HPV DNA, uh, accompanied by normal uh, transaminase le levels and um, uh, the persistence in the liver of CCC DNA and integrated sequences. Uh, and this partial uh, cure uh, endpoint may be uh, in interesting uh, in view of an incremental uh, development uh, of new antiviral strategies. Uh, regarding the emerging uh, treatment targets for HBB cure, um, we have uh, really seen uh, uh, an enthusiastic uh, uh, field of development uh, in the past uh, few years with the development of direct acting antivirals, uh, including entry inhibitors, uh, inhibitors of the viral polymerase beyond the classic nukes, as well as capsid assembly modulators, um, strategies to reduce viral anti antigen expression based on the inhibition of viral transcription, uh, the specific targeting of our RNAs with sRNA or antisense oligonucleotides, and the inhibition of HBS antigen release. Uh, especially with nucleic acid polymers. Regarding immune-based therapies, we have uh, strategies uh, that are being evalu evaluated to invigorate immune responses by boosting innate immunity with TLR7 or TLR8 agonists, or by inhibiting uh, in immune checkpoints uh, with anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-1 uh, um, uh, molecules. Um, there are strategies to stimulate specifically uh, HBV-specific B or T cells with therapeutic vaccines, 
or even strategies to replace the uh, 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 missing uh, components of the immune response, for instance, with exogenous uh, uh, HDS antigen monoclonal antibodies. So having all these assets uh, in hands, uh, now the main question is, how are we going to combine these different mode of action to increase the, uh, the rate of uh, functional cure? Uh, in a very recent uh, uh, paper, we have uh, reviewed the, uh, uh, these different combination therapy, uh, and we have seen that uh, triple and even quadruple uh, combination therapies have been um, uh, evaluated in clinical trials. And I will uh, give you uh, a couple of examples because of uh, uh, time constraints. Um, you uh, all know the uh, RIF2 uh, study from uh, uh, Janssen, which evaluated the efficacy and safety of an siRNA uh, together with a capsid assembly modulator in nuke suppressed uh, uh, chronically infected patients. Uh, and as you know, the triple combination didn't do better than the dual combination of siRNA and nukes. Uh, and you see here the results of the triple combination at the end of the study that were presented at the SLD uh, a few months ago. And you see that uh, uh, approximately 47% of uh, patients achieved an HBS level below 100 international units per ml at the end of the study. Uh, and not worse, no patients achieve HBS antigen zero clearance uh, without restarting uh, at the end of the study, so which was uh, uh, a bit disappointing uh, and, and led J&J uh, &J to stop uh, the, the development of this company and, and strategy. Uh, an interesting uh, uh, combination uh, of the same type uh, using uh, Vibicovia as a CAM, uh, an siRNA uh, and uh, in nuke suppressed patients uh, was uh, performed by Assembly Bioscience in collaboration with Arbutus and showed uh, interesting uh, uh, decline uh, of HBS antigen levels by approximately two logs at, at week 48 of the administration. And um, only the combination uh, having uh, siRNA uh, with nukes or siRNA plus nuke plus the capsid assembly modulator showed a significant decline in HBS antigen levels. So now we are waiting for the uh, longer term uh, follow up of this study. Um, a change uh, also uh, look at uh, a quadruple combination uh, of the uh, previously uh, mentioned uh, sRNA and capsid assembly modulator uh, with nukes and uh, in addition with pegylated interferon. And you can see here uh, that 65% uh, uh, of patients achieve an HBS decline of at least two log, um, um, while uh, 92% uh, were under uh, 100 international units and 48% under 10 international units, uh, but only one patient achieved HBS zero clearance at the end of the study. Um, interestingly, uh, uh, Via Biotech is uh, performing evaluation with siRNA alone or in combination with pegylated interferon, and you see here uh, that the combination of the siRNA with pegylated interferon could reach uh, a three log decline in HBS antigen levels, uh, with uh, four patients out of uh, uh, achieving an HBS uh, clearance uh, at the end of the study, so which looked uh, very promising, and we're eager to see uh, larger uh, trials on this combination therapy. And Biotech is also performing another type of combination with their siRNA plus uh, a neutralizing monoclonal antibody. Uh, in nuke suppressed patients, and they showed uh, a very interesting results in terms of HBS antigen decline in the de novo combination therapy. And here you see the uh, add on strategy when the monoclonal antibody was added uh, to the siRNA, a very uh, 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 interesting additional effect of the combination therapy. Uh, so this uh, looked very promising, and we are looking forward to uh, future studies. Uh, very interesting, again, on the uh, targeting of our RNAs with antisense oligonucleotides, a phase two nuclear study from, uh, uh, from uh, JSK that was presented at ASLD and recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine, showed that in nuke suppressed uh, patients, the antisense oligonucleotide uh, could achieve 
uh, a sustained HBS uh, loss uh, in approximately 10% uh, of patients uh, 24 weeks after stopping uh, therapy. Uh, and this led to uh, um, uh, the initiation of phase three clinical trial. And this is really remarkable because this has been now uh, so many years that we haven't seen a phase three clinical trial for hepatitis B. Uh, now regarding immunotherapies, um, there are uh, very interesting uh, studies for the development of novel therapeutic vaccines that are in phase one, two studies, uh, mainly based on uh, prime boost strategies with novel uh, uh, therapeutic uh, vaccination formulation. Uh, here you see uh, the Vaxitec uh, uh, combination uh, with a chimp adenoviral uh, vector, uh, uh, followed by um, a boost um, with a, a MDA uh, with or without a checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, the JSK is also using its own uh, chimp-derived adenovirus with an uh, MDA uh, and an adjuvant with combinant protein. Uh, and uh, Gilead is using a therapeutic vaccine uh, using uh, genetically engineered RNA, vi RNA viruses, RNA viruses uh, encoding for uh, viral proteins. And uh, these uh, uh, um, uh, vaccines are now in uh, clinical development and we are looking forward to their uh, future results. Uh, now, as you've seen, we have very interesting asset with direct acting antivirals and immunotherapeutics. And the main question is, are we going to uh, combine these uh, direct acting antivirals with these immune uh, uh, stimulators? Uh, and we are looking forward to the, the new clinical trials that are, that are starting or are uh, ongoing. And now if we conclude, if we go uh, to see the uh, new perspective uh, and the uh, innov innovation that are uh, being evaluated in preclinical models, um, there are two uh, main strategies that are being developed, either to uh, 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 directly target a CCC DNA with small molecules, or by gene editing approaches, or by immune-based therapies, try to redirect uh, T cells to infected hepatocyte so that we can uh, um, uh, directly target the liver reservoir of our infection. And having all these tools in, in hand, uh, we are in a very good position to see that in, in the future, we may um, increase the functional cure rate in, in our chronically infected patients. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm now ready to take questions. Massimo, a yes. question, just a question to your colleague. Monday morning, you will available every of these drugs. How would you treat your patient with hepatitis B? The question is to me or to Fabian? To Fabian, you, I think. To me, myself? Yes. <laughs> That's provocative. We have the expert giving a lecture. Um, <laughs> I have only one or more than one available. This is up to you. You can do it's a cocktail. You can do a cocktail. I really, I think that we really do not have an answer today. What is most, what we see is, is going to be probably very interesting is the uh, antisense oligonucleotides, the, the virusen. That is clearly, uh, seems to be a very, a very nice molecule. How to combine it to really uh, go to functional cure is complicated. Fabian really, Fabian Zulim really showed us that some combination do not add uh, great uh, advantage, but some other seems to be uh, going in the right direction. And oh, yeah. I think that we have to stick to that for now. I, I really would like to, to see, I am playing very safe not to commit to myself. Let's see whether Fabian commits himself more. Fabian, last word for you. And we close the symposium. Okay, so, you know, we, we the, the message here is that um, the development of the, all these antiviral drugs is, is, is really challenging. It's uh, hepatitis B is not hepatitis C. 
um, uh, and there, there was some disappointment because the expectations were too high. Now, we, if we go back to more positive uh, um, perspectives, then we, you, you see with the anti-sense oligonucleotide, this is really promising. First time in almost 20 years that we have a, a drug in phase three. So, so that's a, a very good uh, uh, promise. Uh, so anti-sense oligonucleotide, very interesting. How should we combine um, with a, with direct antivirals, uh, nukes, other direct antivirals? Should we add something after the antisense or, or to, to enhance the antiviral effects, the, the HBS loss? Um, interferon is around, should we test it? Um, these are questions, um, uh, and I think we, we need to see this going in a stepwise manner. So first, uh, being safe, short proof of concept that we can increase the GBS loss, and then try to add what we have uh, in a safe manner. So that's, a, uh, and the last message is that keep your patients in, in your follow-up because they are innovations. We, we've, we've heard today, uh, we know better how to manage patients, how to stop nuke if in some very small population of patients, but if they can benefit from that, we should, we should uh, provide them this, this, this innovation and, and the new drugs is the same. So keep the patients in your, uh, in your court, uh, inform them that there are innovations uh, and, okay. and clinical Okay, thank you. Impairment. Thank you very much. There is the last word. So Raphael, we just an housekeeping. Raphael, we just an housekeeping. Uh, just an housekeeping message. There is one question from the audience. I will transfer it to Maria and Pietro that eventually can try to, to, to answer in the chat somehow, but uh, is from Dr. Valegunester. I will later on to transfer to them. You can close now. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you to Massimo Lebrero for sharing the stage. I think we are on time. Thank you very much to the organizers and see you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.